All right, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, for coming today to uh, our our panel on effective federal advocacy. Um, we'd really like to make this, particularly since it's a, a, a smaller group in here, to make it a little bit more interactive. So uh, as we're talking about things, definitely feel free to to you know interrupt us, uh, ask questions, uh, because you know I think what we'd like to accomplish here is to give uh, everybody in this room uh, some better tools for engaging and uh, and being effective on on behalf of uh, of your businesses and on behalf of WISPA. So uh, I am Claude. Uh, I'm the uh, president of WISPA and uh, you know the board brought me on board uh, this this year uh, and one of the the major tasks that I was given was to kind of uh, sort of be the the full-time uh, boots on the ground in DC for for WISPA and to uh, you know help uh, coordinate this team of wonderful gentlemen sitting next to me which I'll, I'll let you uh, each introduce yourselves and uh, sort of give a brief overview of what uh, your role is in uh, in WISPA's uh, federal efforts. Hi, Ari Storch. I am uh, a partner at the Madison Group. It's a government affairs firm in Washington, D.C. Um, I guess the easiest way that I get to sum up is I am one of those corrupt special interest guys, and I am your corrupt special interest guy, so, <laughs> since you're a corrupt special interest, apparently. But no, I represent uh, WISPA before the White House, uh, the Congress, and the various different uh, uh, U.S. departments and federal agencies other than the FCC. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Coran. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Lerman Center in Washington, D.C. I serve as, among other things, WISPA's um, primary counsel before the FCC and uh, work with uh, Ari at some of the other agencies and on the Hill when we need to um, uh, coordinate messaging. Um, because uh, that's what we do. This is the this is the team that coordinates messages and make sure we get it across. And we'll fill you in more on that later as I pass it to Dale Curtis. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm president of Dale Curtis Communications. It's a public affairs PR firm, so I'm the communications guy on this team. Um, I help Claude and the whole WISPA team with uh, messaging with materials, with outreach to the media, with any kind of public communications. I help on the social media accounts um, and on the website. So uh, any PR communications needs, I'm your guy. Fantastic, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so, you know, I, I've, I think our goal, our big picture goal in this session is to try to explain how we all can better uh, work together to, to advance WISPA's goals and to, uh, give you guys some tools tools in the toolkit and explain why those are effective. So uh, at a high level, uh, you know, you already know this because you're, you're here in this room, but the decisions made in DC have a huge impact on, on our industry. Uh, the, the federal government is the, uh, is the only entity that, uh, that makes decisions on spectrum, which is, you know, our industry's critical infrastructure. Uh, without Spectrum, uh, we can't really be providing fixed wireless service. Uh, so it, it's, it's, you know, and there are a lot of entities uh, vying for Spectrum. So uh, it's, it's critical that we're engaged in DC, particularly on, on that issue. You know, we're still a, a relatively young industry for as long as a lot of folks have been uh, doing fixed wireless, that, uh, that uh, knowledge of our industry hasn't really bubbled up quite as much uh, to, to folks, to policymakers in DC. Yeah, the, the folks at the FCC, they, un they know fixed wireless. Uh, they understand us uh, in large part due to the efforts of WISPA over the course of the past uh, several years. Um, but you know, once once you go outside of uh, you know the folks that are down in the nitty gritty of broadband policy, uh, the understanding of our industry drops off uh, pretty quickly. So that's why it's uh, it's very important, uh, you know, from my perspective, to continue to have 
uh, you uh, tell me your stories and so that I can you know, take those to, to policymakers in DC uh, and say like, look, there is somebody in your district who is doing this. And, you know, a lot of times yeah, that's, that's news to them. So, uh, you know, that's how you can help yourself by getting more uh, interactive with your uh, elected officials and, you know, help me get more interactive with, uh, with your elected officials as well. It, it's a, it's a, can be a very uh, symbiotic uh, sort of relationship and, and we can get a lot out of it that way. Um, we're also, you know, particularly on, on spectrum issues, we're up against uh, a lot larger and more entrenched players. You know, you think of the the mobile wireless industry, which is uh, pretty well dominated by uh, a couple of large nationwide providers with uh, which with large uh, regulatory staffs, large budgets, uh, and you know that that makes the work that that we do in D.C. and the work that you can do uh, with with your uh, elected representatives just just that much more important because. You know, I said this yesterday, it's, and I said it again, I'll, I'll keep saying it, uh, it's your stories and your interactions with your, uh, you know, your, your local, your state, and your federal officials that are going to, uh, to really help us to be the best advocates that, that we can be for you uh, in DC. So for now, I'll, I'll turn it over, that's kind of the intro. Um, like I said, for folks who uh, may have just joined, we'd like to try to get this in to be interactive, so feel free to interrupt us uh, and uh, ask us any questions if you like, but turn it over to the, our esteemed panel here to talk a little bit about our gov government affairs efforts. So can I ask everybody a quick question by a show of hands? Who, who's ever been to Washington, D.C. or your own state capitol to advocate for any sort of policy issues? Okay, about half the room. Um, how many of you have ever met your member of Congress or, or state representative and reached out to them? Okay, so a few more. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to say what I think completely. You know, you want my job to be easier. How do you make my job? How do you make Steve's job? How do you make Dale's job and Claude's job easier? Is by engaging. Because our job is to make your job easier, to make your businesses function smoother, and to help you just be successful and, try, and frankly, Try and keep government off your backs and out of your way so you can deliver your services to your customers. Um, we're in a war, you know, to put it very bluntly, with folks who want to make your jobs more difficult because if your jobs are more difficult, their businesses are able to thrive better. We want to make their lives more difficult. It's, it, it's the little cat and mouse game that we play in Washington. Um, that being said, we can't, we can only do so much. The greatest strength of this organization is when we, you know, is, is this room, that crowd when we sat in there the other day for, for Claude's Day of the Whisper, you know, the 2,000 plus attendees here, that's what makes our jobs easier is when that group shows up because that is the strength of this organization is every one of you in this room, what you say matters more to your congressman or your senator than no matter how many times I'll tell them the same thing. And I'm going to give you an example. During the latest CBRS proceedings, and, and let me... Well, let me back up a step. How many of you have ever heard of a company called Microsoft? <laughs> How many of you ever heard of a company called Napster? Anybody remember Napster? Hey. We're all old enough in this room to remember Napster. Uh, how many lobbyists did Napster have in Washington before the government shut them down? Anybody know? Zero. Before Clinton, uh, the Justice Department filed uh, charges against Microsoft for monopolistic activities. How many lobbies did they have in Washington? Zero. Um, there's an old saying in Washington, D.C. It's a, just one of those typical sayings because we always have fun sayings in Washington. Uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Okay? And, and there's a reason now we're at the table because um, we've been on the menu for a long time. Steve had been a one-man operation doing battle at the FCC for years. And over the last several years, the board has decided they've hired my firm as an engagement. We have a whole team, bipartisan team. Brought on Dale a few years ago to help us with the media components and the messaging components because 
government affairs is not just me walking into a, you know to a congressman and saying, "Hey, let's go have a cigar and a drink of scotch in the back room." It doesn't just work that way. Um, what what I have to do is advocate, deliver your message to the members. Dale triangulates that with media components, you know, using other sources to keep that echo chamber going. Steve does the exact same things at, at the agencies and the FCC. This is all part of a larger puzzle. Without you, it doesn't exist. So we, we really need you guys to engage more and more. So as I mentioned, you know, my, my job is to begin going in and developing these relationships with the key policymakers and to tell our stories. And I can do that. I have a great, my, my team and I, we all have great relations. We, you know, there's 540 members of Congress though, okay? We can't be everywhere at all times. Uh, we're up against folks who have not just a team of six lobbyists, but a team of 300 lobbyists, okay? It's a little easier for them to blanket the hill. So what do we need is we need our members to engage and engage on message, okay? And so that means coordinating with us because when we go off message, what happens is we're divided before that member of Congress and they get confused. And I'm gonna give you an example. When the CBRS uh, initial draft rule was, was spoken about a, a week ago yesterday, Yeah. Um, we did a WISPA did a press release that then I was responsible for circulating to a lot of the staff on the Hill that are key players on the issue. What was great, which was phenomenal for me, is one staffer in particular didn't bother to email me back, thanks Ari, you know, which is all it would have been, but she emailed two of her members in her district directly and asked them, hey, Ari sent me WISP a statement, but what do you really think? Okay, now what was great about that is one of our members responded right on message. No, what WISPA said is absolutely, it hurts my business, it you know, puts me at risk, you know, stayed on our message points. The other one, the other person who responded hadn't read our message points, hadn't bothered to coordinate, and said, well, I don't know, I don't know that it's that bad for us. That hurts us. So we need to, to coordinate those message points, and we need our folks to be able to communicate with each other and be engaged, So when, because when that staffer goes back, that's who they really care about. They really want to know what you think in their district as you employ people in their district. They need to know what you think. Um, so as we provide input on legislation, we endorse, we oppose, or we see changes to bills, a lot of times it's going to come back to you folks in the room, and we're going to need you know, to work together on those issues. But that's, that's our primary focus in government affairs. We're developing the relationships, we're laying the groundwork, Ultimately, though, it's for you to kind of, as we say, dot the I or cross the T. And that's where we're going to need to begin reaching out to you and engaging you more often. Yeah, and I'll add on top of that that, that that's why it's critical for, for me and for us to have your input on the front end as well, right? So when, when WISPA is considering taking a position on a particular thing, we really need to make sure that it, it works for you so that we, we don't run into that issue down the pike where, you know, we have a, you know, a constituent of congressmen who actually does care about the issue. And, uh, and then, you know, we're, we run into that scenario where they're, you know, they're, they're honestly saying, well, we think that works for us, but they didn't tell, they didn't tell us that ahead of time. So it, it it's a, it's a very, it, we have to have your input on the front end. And then, you know, once we take a position, we, we need to have everybody on board as well. On, on that point, because coordinating is important, has, is, you know, I'm not going to, by a show of hands, who here has texted, what was the number, Claude? 50457. 504, has everybody here texted WISPA to 50457? Okay, if you haven't, we're going to pause, <laughs> and everybody in the room is going to wait for you. We need you to do that. Because that is how we're going to communicate with you. That is how we're going to be able to get you up to speed immediately and briefly, rather than large emails and all this. We'll be able to coordinate with you so much more quickly. If you could all please do that, that is a, one of the most critical pieces that we could ask of you to do at this point. Yeah. Can you use the? I think they want the you to use the mic so because they can, they're recording. They're recording. It, if you don't mind. When you text this thing. Make sure you include, it'll, it'll come back and ask for your email address. Use the email address that you are registered with WISPA, because I tried to use my corporate email address and it wouldn't do anything. I finally tried my email address that I am registered, my Gmail address, and it went through just fine. But hmm. I struggled trying to use my corporate email address thinking that's what I needed to use. 
So make sure you, whatever email address you're registered with WISPA, that's the email address you need to put into that form. Thank you. So okay, thanks, Al. So let me kind of, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, one more, one um, more question. What do you want us to text? Uh, so what you'll get back, uh, so you text just WISPA to that and you will get a link back with, uh, with a link to our latest uh, advocacy push. And you, all you need to do is put in your, your name, address, and phone number. Well, actually, it'll all already have your phone number because you texted, uh, and then you just click send. Um, the language is in, is in there for you already. You can customize it if you want to, to add your own details, but there's template language there for you. Trying to make it easy for you. So, Ari made a lot of really good points about telling your stories and, um, and the stories that we need to hear and the importance of, of federal lobbying. And, and I think it's, it's also important to kind of realize that this is um, not sort of a binary type of thing. It's not just direct communications, but it's also indirect communications. So I want to kind of talk about that as we go down the list that's on the screen. So developing relationships uh, with key policymakers. We do that all the time. I've been doing what I've been doing since 19 something or another, and you've been doing it since 19 something or another. So we have great relationships, and the people that we meet with, whether it's on the Hill or at the FCC or another agency, they, they, like, they don't mind meeting us because we're pretty good guys, but they really like to see people like you walk in. Um, they see enough of the suits, and when you bring in a CEO or when you bring in um, a business owner and they talk about the issue, not just how it exists on sort of a two-dimensional, uh, I'm here to, to talk about this issue, but it's more three-dimensional, tell me how it affects your business. All right, I can't really answer that. I can only say what somebody has told me, but if I have you with me, um, you can say it firsthand. I just had a call about a, two hours ago with the FCC, and it was like, well, I could tell the story, but I think it'd be better if they heard from you and your team, and you can hear from them directly. And that's, whether it's lobbying or whether it's a particular issue, as this one was, um, hearing from you directly. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about back in, you know, when you're back in district and, you know, uh, engaging with the, the congressman. So I'll talk about it from the FCC perspective. There's also the indirect side, and that's getting involved with the various committees and the policy committees and the government affairs, well, the, the policy committee that helps tell those stories and help tell the message. So now we've got you talking to somebody in district, we've got you making visits to the FCC, but you also are giving me the tools I need to write pretty detailed and long and sometimes really, most times really boring um, pleadings with the FCC, but that's the stuff that they rely on. So you supplement the written message with the personal visits of me, personal visits of Claude, personal visits of you guys, and also surveys. So when we send surveys out and as we did last year, and I can sit there and say 63% of the operators we surveyed said that they had made investments in reliance on the rules the FCC adopted in 2015 for CBRS, and 60% of those people have curtailed their investments based on the threat of the new rules. That's a nice story to be able to tell because it shows that we did the work and we surveyed our members and it's not just me making up numbers. Um, so. Those are the sorts of things where we need your help on and how you can engage and make us more effective advocates. Responding to surveys, um, answering calls. If you're coming to town um, uh, or if we organize something, we're gonna reach out and say, hey, we need you to come tell your story. Um, so I, yeah, please go. I, I just wanna add a, a real life story on the surveys as well. Um, everybody here remembers the open internet order from the FCC on net neutrality and all the Title II regs and requirements that were gonna be passed along to you. Um, several years ago, uh, we did a survey of the potential costs to our members of that regulation. We took those numbers and uh, Elizabeth Bowles was uh, our then uh, Government Affairs Committee Chair. She testified before the House Energy and Commerce Committee as they marked up a bill to repeal those regs from small businesses. Okay, we worked with them to identify the size and everything. In the hearing, we had a Democratic member of the Congress call her a liar for exaggerating the numbers. Didn't say quite directly, but it, it was very well understood what they were saying. We retorted with the survey and the facts. And the staff from the committee on the, on the minority side, on the Democratic side said, you know, we appreciate that because you've really shown us fact, not just making it up. And that allowed us to then negotiate late into that night. And because of that hearing, literally it was, the, it was just a few days later, we were able to get that bill out of that committee. 
and that bill ultimately became you know, ultimately passed. Um, you know, and it's all because we had those facts from that survey because members decided to engage um, that it allowed us to really call out the bunk that they were calling on us. So let me give you another example of ways that you can engage. Um, a few years back, um, a consultant called the Carmel Group decided, um, engaged with um, a number of manufacturers and, um, and operators and with WISPA to develop a white paper for our industry that came out, what, a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. something like that, uh, last fall. Um, and a lot of us had our hands in it ultimately, including Dale who turned it into a marvelous piece at the end because that's what he does. And, but included within that was a rather detailed analysis of like, what does it cost to deploy a fixed wireless network as opposed to fiber or something else? Well, we can't get that data unless a lot of people make themselves available for interviews and for phone calls and provide data and answer survey results that we can use to create a white paper that I use all the time in our advocacy. It's, not, it's lovely to be able to say, yeah, we had a study done about a year ago and we can deploy fixed wireless broadband at about one seventh the cost of fiber and about one quarter the cost of cable. That, that says a lot. Um, and we don't have that information unless people like you are contributing to a report like that. So these white papers, and I guess you're gonna talk a little bit about op-ed pieces and things like that. So let me take the last one, and this is probably also for you and me, Ari, as well, is developing allies and building coalitions. So years and years and years ago, I figured out that WISPA is a very small organization um, up against these, the big dogs. Um, we couldn't really, you know, make our, um, we, we couldn't go alone, right? That would be like hitting somebody with a spatula and when everybody else is walking around with a shovel. So we decided that you know, we need to forge alliances. So on the spectrum side, a lot of our friends are you know, the public interest groups and Google and Microsoft and some of the manufacturers. So we have to deal with those guys on spectrum issues. And what happens when you do that and you build your street cred is you have other companies come to you and say, hey, you guys really get this and we're starting to really get you, so we want to be your allies, like Broadcom and their group is in the six gigahertz band. So when it comes to things like internet governance, well, those are the people who are going to oppose us on that until the last day that they're walking the face of the earth because they believe in very strong net neutrality principles. But other companies and organizations like US Telecom and AT&T and Verizon and a lot of the other uh, large carriers and CTIA, you know, those are the kind of people that are on our side on that one. CTIA, by the way, has been, you know, our... Um, you know, we've been in a death spot, what is a death match with them, you know, mortal combat, if you will, on some of the spectrum issues. So it's important to kind of keep relationships and to disagree without being, you know, he, the guy who's your, 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 your bridge partner one game is going to be your opponent the next. And you just got to remember that as you, as you go forward. And, and you can probably talk about that on the Hill as well, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I, Steve hit all the good points. I, I'm not sure there's much for me to add in that sense. And that, but, you know, as, Coalitions come and go in Washington. Uh, there will be places, you know, where, well, the CBRS is a great example. There were places where we filed with certain associations, and then there were places where the other associations filed against us in the same proceedings. Um, that's what happens. Um, you just have to keep your eye on the ball in Washington and realize that there's always going to be a next step. And so when you engage in Washington, and, and Steve said it well, you have to do it in a positive way. Um, if you just go negative, and there are times to go negative, but if you just go negative, you end up burning your chances for the future and, and building those relationships. And we have to realize, you know, who these players are um, and, and do our best to work with them as much as possible. And those coalitions can strengthen us at times, and at other times they can be an anchor around our necks. So. Yeah, so the, another great example is the Broadband Access Coalition. Um, and this sort of developed, sort of developed when... Um, three of us individually, WISPA, New America, and Mimosa decided that, you know, maybe there's this band above 3.7 that we could all use. What, what's sort of going on in there now? And, you know, through our personal relationships, you know, because I know the folks at Mimosa and I'm good friends with uh, the, the, the guy at New America who handles their special spectrum policy, we, we start talking to each other and we start to triangulate this and realize that, hey, maybe we should get together and build this coalition to ask the FCC to change the rules. And so we've achieved a lot of things um, of significance in the last year, namely that the FCC wanted to move forward with the 
4.7 to 4.2 band and also the 6 gigahertz band at the same time. 6 gigahertz is going to take a lot longer, so we were able to bifurcate the proceeding. That's number one. Number two, the notice of proposed rulemaking the FCC put out asked for comment on every single proposal that we've made uh, on how we can use a portion of that band for uh, for fixed point-to-point uh, -point, uh, service under Part 101, meaning non-auctioned, uh, under, uh, under Part 101 rules. So that happens because not just the institutional relationships, but the personal relationships as well. There's an old adage in town um, that you want to make your friends before you need them. Um, and I know you say that all the time. Uh, there's probably another one that applies to Ari's profession, which is the first thing you need to do in Washington is to be sincere. And once you've learned how to fake that, you've got it made. So um, that, that's sort of humor, right? But sort of true. Um, we're, we're the only sincere ones in the room all the time, right? Um, so that's, um, so that's, that's you know, just a couple of examples of what we do based on our relationships. But I think it also tells me that you guys at the state level and you know, get together with your neighbors and you can do the same thing at the state house. And I think we're gonna talk about that in the session that follows this one on state advocacy, but that's gonna be something that we're gonna be uh, looking to as well. All right, I think we've kind of... I wanna chime in some of the yeah. coalitions. Go ahead. I'm gonna mention one more example of a coalition and, and how powerful it was. On CBRS, on CBRS, Steve and Claude and, and others put together a coalition in support of our approach to CBRS. We had every single rural advocacy group on that proposal. We had eight other industry associations representing completely different industry sectors. Um, you had 11 companies, including the likes of Google and lots of other companies. And so uh, GE, um, when we were communicating our message on CBRS, it wasn't just Little Wispa and one little narrow group. It was a really broad-based coalition. I think that had a real effect in like waking people up that this is not just about rural people that you can kind of ignore from time to time, but this is about you know the economy and business and it's really broad effects. Our coalition represented every single stakeholder except Big Mobile. Uh, except Big Mobile, the Big Mobile wireless companies. Yeah. Oh, actually, just one more point on that. I think uh, one one of the things that's that's critical as well is is whenever you know we interact with policymakers or, or legislators who are who are trying to go out into the field. Uh, you know, we encourage you to to invite folks out to to see what you're doing. Um, but it, it's also very key for when when we when some someone reaches out to us. That uh, that says that you know, hey, I'm 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 going through uh, going through Indiana. Do you have a Wisp that I could visit? That uh, you know, when we reach out, uh, you know, it's it's really great when folks you know rise to the call. And you know, if you were were here yesterday morning, you heard the chairman of the FCC mention you know three specific Wisps that he has visited that have made an impression on him. So you know, that's that's another aspect of uh, you know something that's that's really critical to this whole government affairs effort that we're trying to put together for you. Yeah. You mentioned broadband coalition. I'm looking at Twitter. I looked up, is it broadband access MA? Is that who you're talking about? There, there's not a Twitter handle for the coalition. It's just been an informal body. I think uh, if you want to follow news about the broadband access coalition, follow WISPA on okay. Twitter or Facebook. Got it. I think... Uh, I think there was a website, but I'm not. Let me let me check that, and if I find it, I will let you know. That there is a like website. Broadband, it was called Broadband for Us, with the four being a four. So if somebody wants to help Google this while we're talking, that'd be great. I, I well, if you're gonna stand. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's a um, internetinnovation.org website. That, that Different group. There's a website for everything. <laughs> Um, I, I have to apologize. I, I'm more on the state side where sure. I've had my experience lobbying, but uh, I, there's a point that you guys were kind of dancing around that I think is important to be made, is that uh, uh, if, you're, if you're smart in your lobbying efforts and you're doing that and what you guys are talking about and you build your coalitions and you do that, sometimes you get, like in, in sports, when a ref makes a bad call and he knows it, he gives you a makeup call later on down the road. And uh, sometimes, and I think we saw that with Chairman Pai during his comment uh, when, when you were doing the interview and you said, yeah, I know you guys didn't get your way on that. 
And it's like, and, and, and it's not surprising to find out that some time down the road he's going to carry water for you because he's like, okay, I, I know they didn't get it here, but I'm going to make it up over here, and, and then you're going to get that. And I think that's an important thing to remember is that if you, if you see a failure if, or you get one that you're like, yeah, we didn't quite get it, that doesn't mean all's lost. There, there, there's other places to, to, to get back in the game and to, and to make it up and do that, and that's part of the smart effort and, and not getting all crazy and threatening to kill the chairman's family and do whatever the new, net neutrality yeah. people did and yeah. do that, that you got to keep the advocacy going, be smart and get your voice, but, but stay in control and stay on message. And, and you just um, pass the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Broadband America. Yeah, yeah we're good. A, a great example of that is CBRS. While we didn't get the census tracts, the chairman knew we would. There are credits for, and Claude can yeah. expand on this better than I. Yeah. There are things in there that were not part of Commissioner O'Reilly's proposal that do help us significantly. And, you know, we, we fully believe that those were done exactly as you said, because we've worked it, and you saw the chairman's comments, we've worked it in the proper way. Um, and that, you know, while we don't get everything, but that's Washington. I mean, nobody gets everything. They're, you know, the, the, I, I once had a class on negotiations in college, and, they got, and the first comment my professor made was, if you leave a negotiation satisfied, it was a bad negotiation. Because nobody leaves fully satisfied from a negotiation. That's, and it's all about trade-offs in Washington, and how you can get as much as you can uh, as possible. So, yeah, well, and and I think just to uh, to piggyback off of that, uh, and you know, despite the fact that you know we didn't get everything that we wanted in CBRS, you know, I was I was in my in the course of a, the many many conversations that I had with folks about you know bringing this big uh, broad industry coalition together, uh, one of you know Comcast senior lobbyists uh, you know flat out told me that. Uh, you know, he had never seen the mobile industry not get exactly what they wanted on a spectrum band when they had mobilized as big an effort as they did on, on CBRS, and he, he credited our efforts with, with pushing back on that. So I think that's a, that's a really important thing to remember that, you know, Tari's point, you, you don't always get what you want, uh, but if, you're, if you go about it in a smart way, there's, uh, you know, there's always the next time, and, and to your point, folks, folks remember that. Um, you did a good job on the spectrum uh, filing. Um, we now have comments that are needed by the end of the month for 3.7, mm -hmm. 4.2, and I assume you have filed on that already. Um, I feel that you need to go to your membership list and put out a little thing to get everybody to put a comment in because we've talked about it on WIS Talk, and all I hear on there is, I don't have enough spectrum. We'll comment. The last time we only had maybe a handful of actual WIS that did comment. Mm -hmm. We need to get a bigger showing. Well, and that's, that's exactly why, you know, yesterday, and we'll, we're hitting it again today, that we're asking folks to to advocate particularly on that ban. That's, that's something that I asked folks to do yesterday morning. We're making that same ask today. That's part of the new tool that we brought online. We're trying to make it easy so you can, in just a couple of clicks. But you have a membership list, send out an email this next week, have everybody comment on the NPRS. So, so let, me, let me kind of speak to that because, um, uh, and I appreciate your enthusiasm for it. So on the 29th of October, the Broadband Access Coalition is going to file rather extensive comments, which so I'm going to be spending my weekend is reviewing the draft that somebody else is writing. It means I get to edit and contribute, and there's technical information. So it's going to be a pretty substantial document and pretty much what we've said all along. So I think the time to, um, I'll use the word weaponize the members, is after we kind of get past the first wave and when we're, got, we're down to issues that have sort of, we, we've sort of dealt with the high level issues and we need you guys to come in in a strategic way and make a specific point, not just sort of come in at a high level at the very initial stage and kind of parrot everything that we're saying. So we want to kind of get us out there, see what the other people say, see what issues kind of get resolved, and then those that are outstanding, that's when we want you guys to weigh in and say, how, here's how this particular rule is going to help me, and here's how this particular proposed rule is going to hurt me. So great idea. We're just thinking about, we need to think about it strategically and, and tactically. Tons of comments from cellular, tons of comments from satellite. Every little satellite guy 
this is kind of common. It looks like they're taking over the whole entire product. We have nothing on there other than. Well, it, it, and, and, but let me, we're, we're a little more strategic, and I'll tell you why. Because we don't have the numbers, we don't have the resources. So what we have to do is triangulate between the three of us here at this table and then Claude as our leader. How I bring you in to meet with members of Congress who have commentary to the FCC to talk about how that affects you in your district, in their district, in your community. Dale, who's going to touch on the media side. How can he work with you to get media stories, earned media, paid media, or you know, op-eds or letters to the editor from you and your local press to affect your local member of Congress? We have to be strategic about it. We had 182 WISPs, if I remember, sign a single letter. Great. There were nobody filed against us, but it doesn't. Sometimes that just doesn't matter. And ultimately, it's about the qu quality, not the quantity. When you get down to the way the commissioners work, and you, if you were at Jay Schwartz's uh, forum this morning from Chairman Pai's office, one of his senior advisors, you know, he, he explained it very well. It's you know, it's how you engage with us. Um, it's the quality of your arguments, the substance versus that you know, the, just the screaming nature that all those points. And and to be very blunt. Um, you know, everybody on the Hill, it's funny, when I'll, I'll forward off all our comments, because if you expect them to go to the FCC website, they don't read them. The Hill doesn't read those. They don't, it's too many to read. The poor FCC staff, like Claude used to have to do, have to read them. Yep. But ultimately, that's, what, that's our job, is to elevate above that noise, and, and we'd rather do that strategically. So, and and um, I'll let Dale talk about the media side, yeah. because that's what I do and what Steve does. Dale's job is just as important. Yeah, and just, sorry, Dale, before you start, it, it, to kind of piggyback on Ari's points, what we're trying to put together is a multifaceted strategy that includes FCC, Capitol Hill, and press, and try to, to do all of that in a comprehensive and coordinated fashion. So, you know, just yesterday we started to kick off our, our efforts to, uh, you know, have constituents engage with their members of Congress on this issue before we even filed at the FCC. You know, there are other aspects to that strategy, which, you know, I'm not going to go into, into depth, in depth here, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's why, why WISPA has, has us here, uh, you know, with, with the input from the members and with, you know, further engagement from the members, uh, you know, that's why it's so critical when, whenever we call. Uh, that folks, you know, actually go ahead and, and answer that call because that, that's what makes us more effective. When we've, you know, with everybody, with everybody's input, we've figured out the policy, we've, uh, we've figured out the strategy, and then, you know, everybody engages in a coordinated fashion. That's how, that's how we're most effective. So, sorry, Dale, I think we've all kind of... <laughs> no worries. That's, that's the problem going last. Exactly. No worries. All right, so... Um, so, on the media and public <laughs> outreach side, um, I, I, you know, I've had the privilege of working for WISPA now for almost three years. When the board made the decision to bring on a, a PR uh, advisor and, and supporter, um, it had never been done before, and WISPA was practically invisible in the media. When I was doing my research on this new client opportunity, I had to really look to find uh, good information about WISPA, and there was just nothing in the media. Um, since then, we've had a very steady and, in some cases, dramatic increase in our media coverage. We are now routinely in the telecom trades, um, and yesterday uh, the Claude speech and Chairman Pai and David Reddle speeches were all the lead stories in those publications. Um, but now we're also starting to get out to the next circle outward, which is um, business publications like Fast Company, which wrote a story that said, you know, ISPs, we need more of them. They can't come on strong enough because we need more competition against the big guys. Um, Inc. Magazine uh, publishes the annual list of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in America, and I think there were 15 WISPs on that list this year. That's huge exposure and coverage to a, a national and a global audience. Um, we're going to keep working on getting out to that next uh, big circle of uh, major uh, national publications, you know, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera. We're not quite there yet, but we're going to get there. Um, more local media coverage is a goal for the coming year. Um, 
your local newspapers, your local radio stations. Uh, sometimes there are local bloggers. Um, sometimes you might have a university with a department that focuses on rural affairs or telecom or tech policy. And a lot of times people in those departments write a lot of stuff. So um, that's a priority. And, and I would welcome all suggestions from you on, on anyone locally um, that you can suggest. And I encourage you to get to know those people. Um, it's typically the reporters or the columnists who cover uh, local business, or sometimes they might even be as specific as someone who covers technology or the telecommunications business, because every community has an interest in telecommunications. Um, also, if there are any um, columnists in your local media who are more like political writers, and they, um, particularly from the conservative side, you know, we, we, I'm talking about you guys, do what you do for the most part without government subsidies. You know, conservatives love that. You're entrepreneurs. You are for less regulation. Um, and so we want to cultivate more support among that community. Um, and by the way, we can assist you when you get these kind of opportunities. Say you meet somebody at a, at a baseball game or at a, a barbecue or, or at a chamber of commerce meeting. Um, if you want to cultivate that reporter, let us know. I can help you with talking points with fact sheets, I can send you to the right websites that you can send them to. So, um, and there's so much material, even the WISPA website has come so far in the last year. Um, Will Peterson, the marketing associate that was hired is just doing a fantastic job. And um, if you've not spent any time on the website, I encourage you to look there. The resources there are very dynamic for you. Yeah. Um, in terms of what is newsworthy, um, your opinion on national issues is newsworthy to a local reporter. Net neutrality, you know, there's this big raging debate. We had reporters calling us looking for local people who could comment on net neutrality. Um, if you're making new deployments, that's newsworthy. If you've got some cool new initiative, you're upgrading your technology, or you're going to reach more people, whatever, that's newsworthy. Just, just the fact that you're serving rural areas that no one, where no one else will go is interesting to a lot of people. And as, as we've said before, a, a lot of people still aren't that familiar with fixed wireless. So it just helps to tell that story all the time. If you have what I like to call charismatic customers, you know, the, the ranch at the far end of a long road or uh, a school uh, that was didn't have access to the internet before. I remember talking to you about this last year. Um, made yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I really want to see more stories of how you guys have helped some really great, interesting, charismatic customer get service. Um, pictures are, you know, communicate more than words, so send us photos, send us videos. Um, again, any facts that prove our story, we need all of that. Um, Dale, Dale, I think we have a, we have a I'm question. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Why are only 60% of members responding to surveys? And why are only 60% of members responding? Uh, we had we had um, a hot, we had more than 100 respond, but 60% of the respondents said that they had made investments so or curtailed their investments. So that's the percentage of those that responded responded yes, and 40% said no. So mostly we get all the members responding. That would be terrific. Oh. Well, no. Not today. No, oh. we, no, we, we, we don't have it. Uh, I'm, no, not, I'm not following yeah. you. No, no. We, unfortunately, we don't get the majority of members' responses. And you'd have to tell us in the room why. Um, but that's, oh. no, that's not atypical in polling. And, you know, it's, it's a simple statistics challenge. I mean, most Americans don't vote. So it, it's, it's no different than that. But we do need more engagement. That's part of the reason we're here, because you could play such a significant role. Um, and, and you're all here because you want to make change. You want government to do the things that make you, you want to be able to have your businesses function as smooth as possible and keep government out of your way. And that's why we're saying engage more with us in those responses. Engage more in it where coming to Washington, uh, as Dale said, you know, even if you're just opening, you know, a new sector of business or you've got, you're putting up new towers, members of Congress want to see those. They care about, they have to care about those local issues because ultimately that's how they get elected. 
Um, and the more they hear locally, the more they're going to pay attention to the issues. So that's, that's why the engagement is so needed, more, much more than it is today. Another question? Um, I am surprised that 100% of the members aren't responding. If they are a member, they should engage. Um, and how can we get in the New York Times, and do you have a timeline? Since it sounds like <laughs> no timeline, uh, as I tell people all the time, no PR guy can ever guarantee you any level of media coverage uh, because reporters are besieged with stuff all the time, and there's a um, a limited window on their time and what they can get placed. So it takes a steady, long-term, persistent effort. But Steve and I have been working on the Wall Street Journal for a year. Yeah. Um, now we have Claude as well. Um, the guy calls Claude all the time now. Um, I'm still waiting for the We're still waiting for the quote. article he's going to do on yeah. CBRS. I, I don't want to get into the New York Times. From my perspective, my priority, I want to be out in the Omaha Journal or whatever they are out in where the rural members of Congress who are our stakeholders care. We don't care that what Elliot Engel or Jerry Nadler in urban New York City cares about because it doesn't affect they're not the ones affecting us or carrying our water for us, per se. We need the folks who are, I'm, I'm headed off uh, tomorrow to go to North Carolina with a retreat with a bunch of rural and agricultural interest members. I want those guys in rural North Carolina and all those newspapers on our side. I want the guys in rural Kansas where the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee is from. Uh, you know, I want the Georgia papers where Sonny Perdue, the secretary of the US Department of, uh, of Agriculture is from. Those are the ones that matter to us. It's the folks that it, where it affects us more than it does the big paper. I mean, from you know, from myself, there's business interests for the journal and others for to help our businesses grow. But from a GR federal advocacy engagement level, the New York Times isn't the most important one. The most important ones are your local papers. Okay, great, great point. All right, I need to hustle along here. Um, I just want to mention opinion pieces and like the editorial page of your local paper. Um, they're always looking for good local leaders who will write, write those op-eds or those opinion pieces. Or you can send in a letter to the editor any time. Or a lot of times if there's an article and you want to comment on it, there might be a space on the bottom of the website where you can type in a comment. All that stuff is good. It's your opportunity to pontificate a little bit, get your opinion across. Um, and uh, as Ari said, that has a real impact on policymakers. I'm make two more points. We need more followers of WISPA social media accounts. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube. We put a lot of content out there. Um, social media is like one of the best things to happen to PR because you don't have to depend on my ability to get a reporter to write your story anymore. We have our own website, we have our own channels, we can publish our own stuff, and we can uh, have a direct channel to people who care enough to follow us already. So it doesn't matter that if we're reaching a million people, if we're reaching the right 50 or 100 people, that's uh, even more powerful. And there's no intermediary who's like interpreting my words and writing it a different way. It's direct from us. So uh, we need more fo followers on social media because all of you have networks um, and people who are interested in you and in your companies. And so if you're um, echoing what we post there, if you're retweeting and sharing what we post there, that's going to reach an exponential number of influential people. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, and as you know, people care uh, and pay more attention to something that their friends or their family tell them than, you know, some stranger at the New York Times say. Um, we also have the WISPA report, which is an email uh, report that comes out every other week, usually on Wednesdays. That's where we had just have little quick little blurbs on all the stuff we're working on. So that's a great way to keep in touch. And then again, in most cases, you can share those items on your social media feeds, or you can forward that email to somebody. Um, my hope is that when we leave this room, we're, we're going to have another 25 or 30 um, engaged, active uh, advocates for us at the federal level. And, and not only are we going to have you, but we're going to have other people who are important to you. So your best customers, who you want you to be successful in Washington. Your local chamber of commerce, who knows it's important for the community for you guys to be successful in Washington. Your mayors, your state legislators. Um, we need to build up that audience um, and we need you to help us do that. 
Great, thanks, Dale. Thanks. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, we may have covered a lot. I think we, I think we've actually covered a lot of this ground already. Uh, I would just highlight the um, the fourth item on there. That's uh, that is the uh, the advocacy tool that we just uh, launched yesterday. We're we're um, we're running a campaign on CBRS there. We're running a campaign on, on C-Band there. Uh, we will continue to use that tool to uh, help uh, us engage with you and help you engage with your uh, elected officials in, a, in an easier way. Uh, so I would encourage you to, uh, you know, to bookmark that page, to, uh, to text WISPA to uh, that short code. Um, and I, I think we've covered anything, everything else on this list. Anyone else want to you know, add something I, on, on the this grassroots slide, I'm going to mention site visits. Yeah. Um, and Claude mentioned this. This year, we've had several FCC commissioners visit some WISPA, you know, WISPA member locations, climbing towers, and you know, going out to a farm and seeing. Oh, I got a signal out here in the middle of this field. Um, that's very persuasive. Invite them to your company picnics. Um, invite them right now as they're all running for re-election. All 435 members of the House and a third of the Senate are up for re-election. If you have a competitive race, even if you don't have a competitive race, invite those people to come to your facility in the next three weeks because they're dying to meet voters, right? They'll take any invitation to meet voters. So this is a great time to invite them, but it's any time is a good time to invite them. And um, Ari could probably use more of you to come to Washington when we do our advocacy days, when we go up to the Hill and lobby members of Congress. Um, again, I've been around for about two and a half years and I've noticed it tends to be kind of the same group of people that do that. So we need some new blood. Yeah, and just like one, one quick story on that. So uh, you heard me uh, mention in my remarks yesterday, uh, Scott and Mark LaPere of On Ramp Indiana. There, uh, there are a couple of WISPA members who, uh, you know, Commissioner Carr was looking to set up a trip. Um, I figured out that those were some good guys in the area. We then learned that uh, that they, you know, a congresswoman was going that from that district was going to be uh, tagging along, and they were both very impressed by by what they did. Lo and behold, a couple months later, when uh, Commissioner Carr is testifying before uh, Congress at an oversight hearing one very large paragraph of his testimony to Congress was his, the, the story of his visit there and what he found impressive about a WISPA member, what a WISPA member was doing in rural areas. So that's just a, a very short, concrete example of how things like that can, can make a difference. So let me get the story behind the story. Um, years ago, even one year ago, we would not even get a call from a commissioner to say, hey, I'm going to be in the area, can you meet one of our members? And now they're kind of reaching out to us and saying, hey, I'm going to, hey, Claude, I'm going to be in Arizona. Is there a member there that I can meet? And that to me shows that a lot of the work that we've been doing has um, been really effective because now, you know, it's not just what we say, it's how we say it, it's when we say it. It's, it's, um, it's the professional attitude that I think all of us, all four of us have brought to the organization that Guess these guys, you know, thinking about us when they're setting up their trips. Uh, they're going to be visiting. Commissioner Carr is going to visit a wisp in Minnesota tomorrow, and he's going to see uh, an antenna installed on a grain leg. I don't know if he's ever done that before, but he's going to have an opportunity to take a look at that, and hopefully, it'll be nice weather in Minnesota tomorrow. Right. Okay. So, Ari, I think we're going to move back to you for this. Uh... Pack. So, I mean, you've, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the WISP pack, and if you want to hear more, please come at 7 o'clock tonight uh, at the uh, Voodoo Beach uh, over by the pool um, for a pack event. Uh, you know, we, we look at Wa Washington is a tool chest uh, of tools that we need to use. You're looking at media, you're looking at legal, you're looking at advocacy side here, and we're asking you from a grassroots perspective to be engaged. The pack is another tool that we use for engagement. Uh, the pack is a very, so I'll give you a, a good example. I know we've spoken about it earlier. Um, uh, Claude uh, and I went on a retreat with seven Republican senators, all of whom sit on committees that are of interest to us and some of whom sit on the specific committees that oversee the FCC. Uh, one, the member that hosted it sits on three different committees that are all important to us. Um, and so, you know, that the pack enabled by writing a check to the member who's been advocating for us and helping us and protecting us, 
for us to go, and it allowed Claude and I time outside of Washington to spend time with these members, um, including two members of the Senate Republican leadership, uh, to be pushing our agenda items. Uh, the PAC enabled uh, Jeff Kohler, uh, who's on the PAC board, uh, and Claude and I did, uh, a couple weeks ago to have coffee with the leading Democrat on the House Energy and Commerce Committee Communications and Technology Subcommittee just the other day, um, where we had a private one-on-one, -on -one, hour long or so conversation about all the different issues that affect us. That doesn't happen without the PAC. These are things we can do where it enables us the opportunities to make our case in a much more personal setting. And as I mentioned, I leave Thursday or tomorrow down in North Carolina with a bunch of rural and agriculture interested members. Um, and it's the PAC enabling us to be able to do, me to be able to do that, to spend three days with them to, again, advocate for our issues. The PAC is an important piece. We need your support. This is fun. It's an independent organization from WISPA. All of the funds are controlled by a board that makes a decision on who we contribute to, so it's not just one person's whim that allows these dollars to go out. It's a group decision. Um, and you know, it helps us, frankly, support the members who are supporting us in our industry, the folks who are willing to go to bat for us. Um, and that's why it's such a critical tool for us. So I ask you as somebody who's involved with the PAC, Claude is not a lot of legally, le Claude is not legally involved with the PAC. Now there are Steve or Dale, although they're supporters and contributors to it also. So we're all putting our money where our mouth is on top of it, and we, we're not even the ones affected by it. Um, but this, I can't urge you enough to write a contribution to the PAC as long as you're an American citizen, it has to be individual dollars. Um, but it really, we stretch these dollars, we're very targeted with these dollars, and we're very deliberate about who we support, and we're looking to support people who support you and our industry. So I, I urge you tonight to come out if you can um, at 7 o'clock at the Voodoo Pool. Dale, do you want to add something? Yeah, just to tag on. Um, if you make any political contributions today, and I imagine a lot of you do because you're active in your community, um, that's great. But imagine, you know, you can, you can write your check for $250 or $500, whatever, to a politician, and he gets one check. Or you can put it in the WISP pack, and we get to pool our contributions, and we get to give these members $1,000 checks or $2,000 checks, and it has a much greater impact for you than just making that contribution individually. All right, so we are right on time at the end. Is uh, any, more, uh, any more questions from the audience? Is everybody texted now? Yes, sir. So it's Citizens Broadband Radio Service. It's, it's called the Citizens Broadband Radio Service, and it was it, it, it was told to me that they picked that name as kind of a joke um, because by the previous administration. But if you think about it, citizens, the Citizens Band Radio, the CB radios, you had a little license, or you were only permitted to use it because it was licensed um, licensed by rule. And that's the same rule part that we have GAA, which is licensed by rule and CBRS. So it may have started off that way, but don't get too technical on it. It's, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with CB radios. It's got a lot to do with the use of the GAA band, which is uh, registered use. So, but thank you. All right. You're right, it was off topic, but good question anyway. <laughs> yeah. We, we've in in rare in, in the moments when we get kind of frustrated with the whole process, we've come up with a lot of different names for what it should stand for. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, oh, sorry, we got one more question. Is it on? Um, I spoke with Jimmy about going to the PAC thing tonight, and he said to go to the website and sign up. Yeah. Uh, and so I did that, and it was actually very difficult because I went to the WISPA website and I looked. It said to uh, the to sign up. I'm, I'm telling you, this just happened to me about uh, 40 minutes ago, and it said on our web website, coming soon. So I went to Google and looked for WISPA PAC event 2018 and had a lot of difficulty finding it. I finally did find it, but I just want to let everybody know that I did have some difficulty finding it. So and don't get frustrated. But by law, the PAC is separate from the organization. It has to be. So that's why okay. WISPA's website can't have it. It's WISPA PAC. Uh, .org, okay. I, I did find a, a yeah. something on the internet where it said uh, go here and then I finally clicked here okay. and I got there but when I went to the website uh, about 45 minutes ago yeah. 
I, all I saw it was coming soon. Yeah, the, no, the, okay. the, no it, the WIS, it's wisppack.org. It is up and running, but just you can contribute at the door. Don't worry about okay. it. It's just as easy. So. All right, with that, thank you very, uh, much. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.